Hello and welcome again to Monstrosities, a vlog of Tokusatsu. I'm your host, Matt Burkett. We're only a few days away from Godzilla vs. Kong, which is going to be the fourth entry in Legendary Pictures' Monsterverse series of films. But today we're going to be talking a little bit more about 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla. Of course, this is the first time these two cinematic creatures first clashed. Uh, you know, it's really a fun monster movie on the surface level, but there's also a lot of satire and social commentary that director Ashiro Honda put into it, uh, specifically relating to the relationship of 1960s Japan and the rise of television. And joining us to dive into this topic a little bit further, uh, we have Patrick Galvin. Patrick is a writer for Toho Kingdom and Sci-Fi.com. He's an organizer for Kaiju Masterclass, and he's also a friend of mine and somebody who I consider to be an expert in Kaiju Ega. Here he comes. Patrick, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, Matt. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Thank you again so much for offering to put this together and for uh, for doing this. Like, this is a topic that I don't think a lot of people get to hear about. And uh, can you give us uh, tell us what we're going to be talking about specifically today? Uh, sure. Well, I think amongst uh, Kaiju fans, it's pretty well known that uh, when Ishiro Honda and screenwriter Saki Sekizawa Shinichi made uh, King Kong vs. Godzilla in 1962 that it was intended to be a, a satire on rampant commercialism, in particular as it applies to television in Japan in the early 1960s. I think a lot of Godzilla fans are well aware of that, but I'm not sure. I'm not so sure if it's if the subject has been so thoroughly explored in terms of like you know what's at least, at least in terms of like the YouTube uh, landscape. I don't know if the subject has been that thoroughly explored. So. Um, you know, over the like over the last um, year or so, you and I have talked um, uh, a number of times about doing a, some kind of collaboration. We did the Absolutely. 66 years of uh, Godzilla thing uh, for Nexus Con uh, last year, and I was just thinking, like, you know, okay, what can what can I possibly bring to the table that would be interesting that would also fit the kind of things that you know that you like to have for your content? And I thought, and it just happened that you know, King Kong uh, Godzilla versus Kong was um, coming out. Um, well, the, the, the release, the final release date had probably been set in stone. And I thought, well, hey, you know, maybe this be a good time to look back on the original King Kong versus Godzilla and delve into it in a way that is not done very often in, you know, a lot of the, in terms of the, of the YouTube landscape. So that's basically where the idea for this came from. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. This is actually a subject that I, I mean, as we were talking to, you know, putting this together, there's a lot of just these little tidbits of history that I honestly had no idea about personally and I found fascinating. And, you know, it, it, I think a lot of other people are going to find it fascinating too. So should we uh, bring up the presentation and get started? Let's get started. Let's do it. All right. Hold on. I'm going to, all right, there we go. I will put myself on mute and the floor is yours, my friend. Okay. Well, as Matt mentioned, I am Patrick Galvin. I am a film journalist who's written for a number of websites, namely about Japanese cinema. Uh, I've written for places like Toho Kingdom, uh, Sci-Fi Wire, Our Culture Magazine, uh, Offscreen. Um, again, with primarily an emphasis on Japanese cinema, namely Japanese science fiction. And today we are going to delve into, as I mentioned, the, uh, the social satire and the commercialism satire that Ishiro Honda was going for in King Kong vs. Godzilla. Hence why this presentation is titled King Kong vs. Godzilla, A History of TV and Japan. So we can go to the first slide, please. Okay, as I think a lot of Godzilla fans are aware, King Kong vs. Godzilla remains to this day the most highly attended of all the Japanese Godzilla films. And it was also kind of a, um, historically, it was kind of a significant film in terms of Toho's history. The year 1962 has kind of an interesting backstory for Toho. Um, Toho began in the 1930s as a group of initially independent, unrelated um, entertainment companies, some involved in films, some involved in theater, that had their own uh, backgrounds, had their own starting dates, and again, initially were totally independent of one another. Um, and Toho itself was actually formed when all those companies were bought up and merged together into one big trust in 1937. That's when Toho was officially established. However, the uh, main corporation, uh, Tokyo Takarazuka Theater, was formed in 1932. This was the company that ended up buying up all the others into one big single conglomerate. And so even though all these, some of these companies that helped form Toho, some of them go back even further to like say the 1920s. 32 was the the uh, the year of creation for the main central corporation. Hence, therefore, 32 was what Toho identified as its establishment year. Hence, 1962 would become its 30th anniversary. And so in, um, 
in helping to quote unquote celebrate this particular milestone in their history, Toho put together a couple of uh, banner releases, um, films that they wanted to really showcase. One of which was uh, Kurosawa Akira's uh, samurai comedy Sanjiro. Another was Itagaki Hiroshi's uh, Chushin Gura, which is a huge monumental uh, Chanbara film about the, the 47 Ronin, a film that is jam packed with um, recognizable faces from, uh, from Kaiju Ega. And another, another film was uh, King Kong versus Godzilla. Uh, King Kong versus Godzilla more than lived up to his expectations as a banner release. The film, when it first came out, drew in about 352 million yen. And it was the fourth highest grossing uh, Japanese film of the 1961-62 rankings. Uh, it drew in an attendance of 11.2 million in its first uh, release. And it has been subsequently re-released a number of times over the years. And the accumulation is, up, is approximated to be about a little over 12 and a half million. It is, remains to this day the most highly attended Godzilla film in history. The only film which comes close is the original Godzilla from 54 with an attendance of about about 9.6, I, I do believe. Um, and it was kind of, even though it was built to be successful, it was kind of a surprise to a lot of people, um, including um, people who were involved in it. Um, like the actor Yu Fujiki, who was one of the two main, two, one of the of the two, uh, one of the male protagonists. Um, he's the guy who in the American dub version is always complaining how about, uh, about his corns being in pain when there's an, a monster around and such. Um, Yu Fujiki uh, remarked that, you know, um, Nobody at Toho thought it was going to be as big as it ended up becoming. You know, Kaiju Egg at that point had had varying degrees of success, some more than others, but nobody really thought it was going to be this big of a film. And it's funny that I mentioned Yu Fujiki because um, his involvement and some of the other people around him might have actually had some kind of small factor in this film's success. If we can go to the next slide, please. Yes, on the screen here, we have Tadao Takashima on the left. We have uh, Yu Fujiki in the middle, and we have Ichiro Arishima on the far right. All three of these guys were pretty prominent faces in um, movies about in movies that were about uh, the Japanese corporate environment, about salary men, salary man pictures. Japan has, for many many decades, had a fascination with literature and entertainment revolving around office workers and uh, white collar workers and such. And all three of these guys were prominent uh, faces in that kind of genre study. Tada uh, Takashima and Fujiki had been in an, about. Oh, I think, I think upwards of 10 films of that nature by this time. And Ichiro Arishima, who was once labeled the Charles Chaplin of Japan, was an established uh, actor and very popular comedic actor in films like the Wakadai Show series with Yuzo Kayama, as well as uh, the Shot Show series with His uh, Hisaya Morishige. And so the kaiju film was still running pretty good at this time. And the salaryman comedy was running very good at this time. And and that it was that you know that merge that is possibly what made King Kong versus Godzilla so successful. Um, however, uh, something else that's worth bringing up is that uh, the other thing that people, I, th I think a lot of people are aware of the salaryman element of King Kong versus Godzilla, and of course they're also mentioned they're also aware of as I mentioned before the um, the television satire of the film. At the top of the screen, we have a quote from Ishiro Honda talking about the screenwriter Shinichi Sekizawa. Sekizawa had a background in writing, like you know. TV song lyrics and so on and so forth. He had a back, so he had some insight in, into television. And that's where the real fascinating element of this film really comes into play is that whole dissection of the state of commercialism in Japan in the early 60s as it related to television. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And here we have a couple of quotes. The bottom one is from Ishiro Honda talking about like, you know, what he was trying to go for with uh, King Kong versus Godzilla. The above quote, which came from 1957, is from Soichi Oya, who was a, a uh, social critic in Japan. He was kind of known as the, um, the emperor of the mass media in Japan during his lifetime. And he was famously, famously critical of television as the Japanese were developing it. He was very... Um, turned off by the grotesque nature of television, by the very sensationalist nature of television in Japan. And he was, and he very famously wrote about the quote unquote campaign to turn Japan into a nation of 100 million idiots. And so that's, just, and so it wasn't just Honda who was like, you know, seeing this kind of like, you no know, phenomenon happening in Japan at the time. It was pretty well established by other people and such as intellectuals like Oya. So if we can go to the next slide, please. 
And so, and to really understand the um, the phenomenon of Japanese TV and what Honda was poking fun at in King Kong versus Godzilla, I think it's worthwhile to um, delve into like the history of TV in Japan and how it became, you know, the phenomenon that it did become. So, television, really briefly, um, P uh, European and American researchers had been uh, developing ideas of electronically transmitted images since the late 19th century. The word television itself was actually coined by a Russian scientist in 1900. So it was, for lack of a better word, it was kind of like you know, a turn of the century kind of thing. Um, early experiments were pretty crude. Um, it was it was nowhere near as sophisticated as like you know what would even appear in say King Kong versus Godzilla initially. Um, and it was also kind of fitting that um, that TV would come to Japan around the time that it did because the late 19th century was also the time of the Meiji Restoration. Japan had been about 20 years before that forced out of its self-imposed isolation from the rest of the world. And the Meiji Restoration run by Emperor Meiji's um, administration wanted to modernize Japan by sending Japanese overseas to study Western technology and bring back what they had learned to Japan to help Japan refurbish its technological growth, its architecture, its ways, its uh, literary rate, et cetera, and so forth. And so it was only fitting that, you know, a lot of Japanese uh, engineers had their eyes on television and became curious about, you know, developing it themselves. And in 1923, during the Taisho democracy, in which Japan was even more westernized than it had been during the Meiji era, um, there was a Japanese engineer named Kenjiro Takianagi who became very fascinated by television development. He was reading about it in um, foreign technology journals. And so he decided that he wanted to actually be part of, he wanted to actually study that himself and develop television for, help develop television for Japan. And over a course of about three years, he, he studied it while he was an associate prof professor at what is now part of Shizuoka University. And, in 19, and on Christmas day of 26, which as it happens was also the day that Emperor Taisho passed away, Takayanagi actually managed to successfully tra uh, transmit an image onto the display end of a, of a cathode tube. In this kind of context, we can think of it as the cathode tube being sort of like, you know, a TV screen without the chassis around it. So what he did was he took a piece of parchment and he, using very dark ink, he drew the katakana character pronounced as E onto it. He filmed it and he managed to project it onto the display the, of the cathode tube. And if we go to the next slide, that's what he managed to actually produce. And so that would, and so it was kind of like a, a very significant landmark, not only for him as a researcher, but also for Japanese development in this, in this kind of um, engineering. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. Now, while Takianagi was doing his research, um, Americans and Europeans in the same field were pushing ahead with their own research projects. Um, they were making, obviously because they had, you know, better technology and they were, they had more, several decades ahead of the Japanese in terms of this kind of research, they were making better progress than the Japanese. Although it was still very crude, they were still, they were man managing to transmit things like, you know, um, symbols, faces. And I believe in 1927, I think I could be wrong. They managed, uh, American uh, researchers managed to transmit a, uh, a speech by Herbert Hoover, who would later be president, but who at the time was the secretary of commerce, I do believe. Um, but during this time, you know, the Japanese were continuing to read about what they call the Musei Nenshi, the far ceiling wireless device. And, and when it was decided in, in the 30s that the Olympics were going to be held in Tokyo, the Japanese decided to double up on their research into, into television, push ahead with it even further than they had before. There was one organization which I which devoted about 12% of its entire annual budget to developing uh, television. And even though the um, even though the Olympics was initially removed from was initially canceled was uh, canceled first in Japan and then in total in 1938, uh, the Japanese continued to push ahead with their research anyway. And in 1940, NHK, the broadcasting company, which is still extant today, started off in radio and now is in in television and such. They managed to produce a 12-minute experimental drama called Before Supper. It was extremely crude. It was basically like a one-act play and just focused on, you know, a family of three, two parents and their grown and their uh some and their grown daughter, just their lives, you know, before their evening meal. It was purely for experimental reasons. It was not, there was no television network 
in like mainstream audience to uh, show it to. It was just as a way of the for researchers to continue to push ahead with this with uh, their topic of interest, which was the development of television and televised images. And um, and so that would segue into our next topic, which is let me go to the next slide, please. The stall of research, and that was because of World War II. World War II brought about a lot of sanctions upon Japan, and at one point, the Japanese government completely closed off all foreign imports from America and such. So the Japanese researchers really had no opportunity to um, learn anymore about the development of TV because they were literally cut off from it. And then, you know, World War II happened. Japan lost the war. Japan was heavily devastated, and then it fell into the occupation by the Allied powers, namely the Americans. That lasted from 1945 to 1952. And during this time, Japan was far more occupied with post-war reconstruction than they, than they were with developing uh, further advances in television technology. However, even though that, even though TV was still many years from uh, reaching Japan, you know, in its in its a uh, truly recognizable form, um, the stage was sort of being set for TV during this long gap. Japan had had fully functioning radio for many, many decades. And during this time, radio was kind of helping to set the stage for at-home entertainment. You know, shows like uh, What Is Your Name, which was a hugely phenomenally popular uh, radio drama that was later adapted into three very successful movies in the 50s. It was discovered that um, during this time, there was a survey in 1952, the final year of the occupation, which found that the average Japanese would listen to, on average, about three to four and a half hours of radio a day. So again, even though TV is not here yet, the stage for at-home entertainment is already kind of being set. In 1950, a politician named Shinichi Kamimura went to uh, America to oversee, like you know, what America was doing, like you know, as a society and such, and he noted the development of TV. And Kamimura reported on TV pretty enthusiastically. Uh, while he did notice some notice and report some negative qualities, such as you know children who were much more content to watch TV all day instead of going outside and playing, um, he noticed that you know he thought that TV kind of like helped homogenize the American people. He liked the idea that you know uh, fathers would come home immediately after work to watch TV with their families. He liked the fact that you know families would oftentimes watch the same programs on TV together. That they would watch their um, the presidential speeches on TV together. He liked the idea of this homogeny. And of course, Japan has a long history of wanting to have some kind of homogeneity with its people. So he reported on it very enthusiastically, and he was a, he was an absolute um, supporter of the idea of Japan having television itself. And so if we can go to the next slide. And so the following year, in the beginning of February, is when Japan officially begins broadcasting television. It began with NHK broadcasting a recorded scene from a kabuki play, and there were also an assortment of other programs that were available initially. It wasn't a huge selection, as you can imagine. Things like uh, talent shows, uh, newscasts, sports shows were very popular. Things like sumo wrestling and um, baseball were extremely popular to televise in Japan at that time. And of course, there were some American shows that were imported, uh, westerns and uh, sitcoms. American westerns in particular were very popular with the Japanese initially. They also had kind of like you know, um, like a histo like a like a quote unquote educational value because they were westerns, they were historical film, they were historical, they were set in like it was an opportunity for Japanese to quote unquote learn about you know the American past and so on and so forth. Um, however, even though Japanese were very interested in TV and very captivated by it, it wasn't exactly a immediate sensation with the mainstream public in terms of like you know consumerism when. Uh, in 1953, by the end of the year, uh, there were only about 866 television subscribers in the entire country. And the vast majority of those were actually businessmen, uh, businesses who would buy TV sets, put in like, you know, their department store windows or inside their barber shops to draw and, att and attract customers. And to demonstrate why that was, uh, the cost, a TV set at that time was very expensive in Japan. The cheapest you could get would cost about 175,000 yen. By contrast, the average Japanese worker at that time made about 15,000 yen a month. So basically, a TV set was it cost, the cheapest set available would cost about a little under a year's worth of salary. Then on top of that, you have, you know, subscription fees, which can amount to like, say, more over 2,000 extra yen a year. 
And by and by contrast, as a as a point of comparison, at that time in fifty three, a Japanese home could be bought for about two hundred thousand yen. So basically, in short, a TV set cost just a little under what a house cost at that time. And there were other practical reasons as to why it was not a huge immediate thing with the everyday person. You know, Japanese architecture, Japanese roofs and such were not built strong enough to really support the uh, television antenna at that time. There was also things like, you know, uh, antenna being knocked down by wind and rain and such and so on and so forth. So it wasn't considered to be very practical for the average person to have a TV set at that time. But businesses uh, took immediate advantage of that because they realized they could draw in a lot more people by putting in TV sets in like their establishments. And there, and also it wasn't, and there was also sometimes like a, a very amusing anecdote would be like a, there was a Japanese politician in rural Japan where TV is at this point extremely rare. It's like far away from Tokyo and Osaka out in the, out in the back of our area. There was a man who was running for political office who to help boost his likability and to boost his um, popularity with, the voters, he actually bought a TV set and every single night would invite people over to come watch TV just to help improve his chances of winning the election. Um, so that's basically what, that was primarily who the main consumers for TV was initially. It was people who could afford it, which was not the average person. Um, in spite of the, and as a small, one more little anecdote to help segue into our next slide, um, there was one barber shop that reported that, you know, once he brought, bought a TV set, put it inside of his um, establishment, there was, whenever it was time for a certain season of sports, people would come in for a shave practically every single day just to watch TV. And that particular sport we will reveal in the very next slide. Next slide, please, Matt. Oh, actually, go back really quick. <laughs> okay, as I think, I think a lot of Godzilla fans are aware of the fact that you know, a lot of the fight choreography in King Kong versus Godzilla is heavily inspired by pro wrestling. You know, Nakajima and I forget his name, but the actor who was playing King Kong, a lot of their moves were choreographed based on sumo and pro wrestling moves. And that's the sport, one of the main sports that was of immediate interest in Japan when television, start, when television started broadcasting, as we shall find out on the next slide. Now there's a lot to unpack here. One of the main, uh, one of the first major post-war media heroes in Japan was actually a man named Mitsuhiro Momota, who went by his stage name, Riki Dozan. Um, he was a, he was a huge national hero for uh, the Japanese um, in the post in the post war and post occupation era because of the fact that on national TV in that same year fifty three he defeated the American Sharp Brothers on nationally broadcast TV. Keep in mind this is after the war after the occupation so there's a lot of anti American and a lot of anti Occidental sentiment in Japan at this time. And so the idea of a Japanese man, like, you know, basically giving it to the Americans through an act through even through like a, say a sports match was considered, it was, it, there was a lot of, a lot of interest in it because of that, because of that alone. In fact, um, let me just pull up my quote here. There was one uh, Japanese a spectator who wrote, we lost the war, but this time we gave it to the Americans through karate chops. So, I <laughs> know, and, and Ricky Dozon, his television, even though, again, even though television is primarily owned by businesses or it's television sets that are set up on uh, plazas for public viewing, you know, he drew in enormous crowds and his popularity helped increase the demand for TV sets in Japan because people loved him. They loved his matches and they wanted to see him, you know, continue to represent them, if you will, on the screen. Now, the really ironic thing about the whole thing, especially with that first match between Ricky Dozon and the quote unquote American Sharp Brothers, is that there's this that whole uh, that whole state, that whole fight was basically a big subterfuge. First of all, the, sh the fight was thrown. The Sharp Brothers had agreed to lose in advance to Ricky Dozon. They were that was they, they did not. They basically allowed themselves to be defeated by him. Second of all, the Sharp Brothers were not American. They were from Canada. And third, and this is the most interesting thing of all, Riki Dozon was not Japanese. Riki Dozon was a Korean man. He was born in Korea at a time when Korea was still occupied by the Japanese. And he eventually emigrated to Japan sometime in the 1940s, I believe. And so he grew up speaking Japanese. He, he could speak it very fluently. So that's how he was able to pass himself off as a Japanese to so many people. And, but the, and here's the really ironic thing. The part of Korea that he was originally from is now part of North Korea. 
And consequently, Ricky Dozon became kind of a very interesting, he became a, 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 a figure of interest, not only to the Japanese, but also to Kim Jong-il, the supreme ruler of, Korea, of North Korea, you know, around, around this time in the 50s and the 60s. You know, uh, Kim Jong-il is also, though, as people know, the mastermind behind Pulgasari, the North Korean kaiju film. Um, and uh, Kim Jong-il tried to lure Ricky Dozon back into Korea a number of times during his lifetime. He never consented. And after uh, Ricky Dozon passed away in the mid-60s, I do believe, um, even though he was buried in Japan, Kim Jong-il erected a tomb for him in North Korea. So <laughs> just a, that, that, that has nothing to do with King Kong versus Godzilla, but it's just a very interesting, I, just a very, very interesting um, insight into how Japanese TV was, you know, very, in, in, it was sensationalized, it was subterfuge. It was kind of from the very beginning, this very strange sen form of sense of, sense of centralization. And so we can go to the next slide, please. This is a photograph of the type of crowd that would come to watch Ricky Dozon when his, um, when his uh, matches were being broadcast. That small little box in the lower left corner, that is the TV screen. It's not very big, but look how enormous the crowd is. There was one report of a crowd of about 20,000 people that came to watch just one of these plaza screen, uh, plaza, plaza TV um, showings of his wrestling matches. He had that big of a draw in Japan. And so as you can imagine, now that Japan has a national hero for in the form of a Jap in a in a strange way, a Japanese quote unquote TV star, even though TV star not as we imagine today, but a TV star in terms like you know, he was a recognizable figure who was on TV. Now that, that now that Japan had one of those, there was a lot higher demand for TV amongst the Japanese consumers. And if we go to the next slide. This is how quickly uh, television skyrocketed in terms of purchases in Japan following that first year. As I mentioned, there were only about six, uh, 866 sales in the first year of, in the first year in Japan, but by the following year, it's already gone up to 17,000. You know, the television companies realized that you know they could make a lot more money selling more sets for less money than you know vice versa. And by 1958, after only five years, the cost of a TV set on average had dropped from about 175,000 to about 60,000. So you know, so now, so now you could buy a TV set for about three months' salary as opposed to a full year's salary. And there was even further, furthermore, increased interest in TV when it was announced that you know uh, the uh, Crown Prince Akihito, who would later become the Heisei Emperor announced that he was going to get married to a commoner, no less, Michiko Shoda. So Michiko Shoda became kind of a public interest figure because she represented everybody else, she represented the common people, and she was being inducted into the imperial house. And at this time, around 1958, there was already a, a TV show called Television Wedding, in which the producers would actually pay people to, they would, they would pay for their wedding expenses in, ter in exchange for the right to film and broadcast it. I don't know if any TV companies paid for any part of the royal wedding in 59. I seriously doubt it. But it was but as you can but it was but the point being that you know there was already a huge uh there's already there's already an audience for this kind of thing to begin with and now it's involved at the, at the imperial house level. And so by 59 in time for the royal wedding there's now more than 2 million sets in Japan versus the less than 1000 that had been there only 6 years earlier. That's how quickly things were growing in Japan in terms of television interest. And this wedding, by the way, was once called Japan's first electronic pageant. That's basically what it was known as. And if we can go to the next slide, please. And so flashing forward to the year of King Kong versus Godzilla, there's now more than 12 million sets in Japan. More than half of the pop, more, more of half of the homes in the country have a TV set. And so even though Japan's only been broadcasting for, at this point, you know, less than 10 years, and even though countries like, you know, England, for example, have been broadcasting TV since the mid-30s, but already Japan is already the second highest consumer in terms of television sets in the entire world, second only to the United States. And around this time, demand for TV is going up even further because around this time it was established that the Olympics of 64 were going to be happening in Tokyo. And this time it was at this time the Olympics would actually stay in Tokyo. They would actually follow through this time, unlike in the in the four, in the in the 30s. And so that's a national interest. The Olympics are happening on Japan's home turf 
everybody wants to watch it. If they can't go to see it in person, they want to stay at home and watch it on TV. So that's only increasing further the de demand for TV in Japan. And also around this time, really, really briefly, um, after the um, the U.S. Security Treaty of 1960 and the subsequent demonstrations that happened, Japan switched prime ministers and uh, the new prime minister, uh, Hayato Ikeda, or Ikeda, he introduced what he called the double income plan, which made TV even more affordable than ever was before. So all these factors combined are creating what you might call a synergy to like really boost up accessibility and interest in TV in Japan. And if we can go to the next slide. It was also kind of an interest because, you know, tell, because even though most Japanese at this point are still kind of in the lower middle class, in spite of the double income thing, um, appliances like TV were kind of being viewed as symbols of joining the middle class. And so Japanese families would consciously budget themselves so they could afford to get this kind of thing because it would ex it'd make them, it uh, help them reach this kind of social standing that they wanted to have. And by 1965, I want to say, it was found that you know 90% of Japanese people consider themselves to be part of the middle class. So it was it was part of that whole synergy as well. Um, and during this time, there was a proliferate. And during this time, you know, Japanese are spending many many hours a day watching TV, especially housewives who are stuck who are stuck at home all day. You know, them watching TV was kind of like you know their way of feeling like they were staying in touch with the rest of the country. Even though they're confined to their homes, you know, cleaning and raising the kids, they can they can watch TV and stay on top of the news and such. Yeah, so it was like they were also a huge demographic. It wasn't just like you know men watching sports; like even women were very key on this on this whole thing as well. And during this whole time, there were initially some plans to use television for educational reasons, not only with like news broadcasts, but also like you know informative science programs and so on and so forth, educational television. However, as we see from this quote here from Jason Makoto Chun, who is a historian who wrote a very useful book about the development of TV in Japan, um, the TV executives found out that, you know, this kind of in education, in educational stuff, <coughs> excuse me, did not exactly get very high ratings. Instead, audiences went for the, the flashy, grotesque, spectacular, silly nonsense kind of stuff, the kind of stuff that people like Suichi Oya, the critic, lambasted as being like, you know, an, something that was like, you know, dehumanizing the country, turning into a nation of idiots. And so, as we see on the next slide, as you know, King Kong vs. Godzilla opens up with Mr. Taco watching, as it happens, a science program produced by his company, and he's bored to death with it. And he gets a call from his boss, who's also bored to death with it. And he remarks that the TV program, the science show, is only getting a rating of about 5%. Charitably put, it's not doing very well. And so that's kind of a nice, and so you can read that definitely as, as Honda referencing the fact that, you know, audiences were not going for the intelligent stuff and the TV companies were just exploiting the stupid, silly stuff that got better ratings. And so we can go to the next slide. So what did get a lot of publicity? What were the kind of shows that got tons of uh, attention? Well, there were talent shows that focused on bad auditions. Think American Idol before American Idol. You know, like there was one television show called uh, Singing Contest, which in which the producers would purposely seek out bad singers because it because it, it got it made people laugh and it got better ratings as opposed to showing people who actually like, you know, could pull it off. Uh, there were also um, television dramas that focused on controversial subjects like extramarital affairs. You know, shows like this would, you know, get a lot of backlash from the social critics. But that controversy, you know, there's, like they say, you know, no such thing as bad publicity. It's true in this case. Shows like that, shows like uh, Days of Betrayal, one such show about extramarital affairs, got tons of ratings from its subject matter and from the publicity of the controversy surrounding it. And then you have things like, you know, Pink Mood Show, in which you had erotic dancers, basically meaning women with no clothes on, dancing at Toho's own Nichigeki Music Hall and it being televised and broadcast late at night around, like, say, 11 p.m. when kids are ideally in bed and such. And then you have reality TV. And here's what really got under the skin of people like Soichi Oya. There was a reality TV show very aptly named the Let's Do Anything Show which in 1957 staged a very well-documented and very controversial and highly reported uh, quote-unquote event. 
there was a baseball game happening at Waseda University and the, the television producers hired somebody to go into, to, to take a, a flag for the rival team, go into Waseda University's cheering section and start cheering for the rival team on the on their on the on Waseda's home turf. And then the television companies filmed the whole, you know, scuffling that came after that, the whole shouting and jeering and, and squabbling and such that came afterwards. And it was sensationally broadcast, got tons of ratings, was reported all over the place. And this was the thing that really pushed critics to say, you know, is Japan really turning into a nation of hundred million idiots because of things like television? And so that's basically you know, the kind of environment that, you know, King Kong versus Godzilla was being, you know, made in. This is the kind of stuff that was getting attention on TV. And so it's, and so when Honda made this film and you have this idea of you know, like, you know, a television pharmaceutical company trying to capture a monster to not only help promote their own products, but also to steal ratings from Godzilla, who's ravaging the country and getting publicity through like the news and the news and the movies and such. You know, that's just basically Honda and Sekizawa making fun of like, you know, what companies would do to get, you know, extra publicity and extra ratings. And if we can go to uh, the next slide, we mentioned uh, pro wrestling. There's also another event that's worth um, mentioning here. Um, a couple of months before uh, King Kong versus Godzilla premiered in theaters, there was a, um, a wrestling match with um, Freddy Blase and Kazo Okamura, whose stage name was uh, Great Toga. Uh, Blase actually bit into the forehead of Okamura and his blood was shown before the live audience and on television and two elderly viewers, you know, at the sight of the blood and such collapsed and unfortunately passed away. That was highly controversial, but you know, controversy, no such thing as bad publicity. The ratings just shot up to like, you know, you know, pro wrestling on average did like, you know, 50 to 80% anyway. And this just like increased the market for this kind of thing. And, and in response to like, you know, the whole, why would you show that on TV? You know, NTV's manager would actually say, well, hey, you know, it got high ratings. So just to, as a way of defending the whole the whole practice. And of course they created, the, they uh, also beg questions like, well, how do you know they didn't die from like, say like, you know, old age or a heart attack or high blood pressure or whatever. So there was, there's all that stuff goes in this kind of thing as well. So, so yeah, in, in a strange way, Mr. Taco is kind of like, you know, a slightly more sympathetic caricature if you will of the kind of things that we see at this that we that were happening at this kind of at this time and so if we go to the next slide yep so that's the, again there's a taco talking about bringing in a monster it will hook viewers and honda's quote about like you know medicine companies only got to produce good medicine but you know if they get a monster to promote their product you no know, all the better for them they or so they think and so the next slide and so that's basically like, you know, that's the kind of environment in which King Kong versus Godzilla was made. And that's the kind of thing that Honda was poking fun at. Of course, you know, he dialed it down. He didn't go as, he didn't go super explicitly into it. Like, you know, some other films at the time might've done films like say uh, giants and toys from 50, very good film, which you could actually find on YouTube, by the way. Um, but anyways, so now we're, now we're done with that. Let's talk about um, the aftermath of TV. Like what did the whole television phenomenon mean for Japan in the long run? Well, long story short, it only just got worse from there. You know, by 1964, in time for the Olympics, now color TV is pretty prevalent. And by 1970, only six years later, eight years after King Kong versus Godzilla, 95% of all Japanese homes have a TV set. And as you can imagine, like, as I mentioned before, Japanese would spend like, you know, three plus hours a day watching TV to begin with. And that's only exacerbating because of this, this whole situation. And the spread of television and the accessibility of entertainment at home, combined with other factors like changing in Japan's economic policies, all those factors combined, in which television was a part, led to the decline of Japanese film of the Japanese film industry. Yeah, as we see from this chart here, in 1958, when television was still popular but not exactly taken over things entirely, the film attendance in Japan had reached an all-time high of over a billion people. Flash forward to the year King Kong vs. Godzilla comes out, 62 that number is basically cut in half and it's only falling from there. 75 things are in extremely bad straits. As a lot of people know, this is the year Teramek and Godzilla came out and did terrible business. But however, flash forward to 1980 when Japan's economy is bouncing back. Attendance is better. Not except not, it's not exceptionally better though. And over the years, Japan's tel uh, film audience has, you know, wavered a little bit, but it has never even come close to matching like, you know, what had reached 
its golden era of say 58 and before that point. And for and in 2019, it was only about 195 million, not not that much better than like the, the low of 1975. I chose 2019, by the way, because that was the last pre-COVID year for Japanese movies and such. So it wasn't affected by the pandemic and such. But yeah, so that just basically gives you an idea of like, you know, basically how television came to rise in Japan, how what kind of things Honda was poking fun at in Japan, and ultimately what, te what television did to the Japanese film industry. And if you can go to the next slide. Now, one of the main sources for this... Um, for this presentation was a book by Jason McCuddle Chun, who I mentioned earlier. His book, A Nation of 100 Million Idiots, is an extremely valuable resource in terms of understanding television history and its effects in Japan. And as we as we see from this this uh, this quote here, he talks about how things have changed a little bit since the since the development of TV and the explosion of popularity of TV. However, there's still this huge attraction to sensationalism, scandal shows, talento, talent shows, and so on and so forth. And actually, as a little bonus, we have on the next slide, I asked our friend Norman Anglin, who is a who directed uh, the documentary Bringing Godzilla Down to Size, uh, short films like the uh, a mini feature called The Idol. He also uh, did a lot of uh, set reporting on kaiju films for Fangoria in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, Norman's lived in Japan for 29 years. And so I decided to ask him, like, you know, in your almost 30 years of living in Japan, you know, has things have has the state of Japanese TV changed that you've observed? And as he write, as and as he um, tells here in this quote, you know there is still that interest in you know people who just get who just gab. There's still sets that are flashy and ridiculous, MCs that are overdressed, you know, and you know, and it's just like you know shows of it's like you no know, wit competitions. And he also in this nice little this uh, interesting little quote here about like you know when uh, Kobe the city was heavily devastated ninety five by the Kobe earthquake. You know there were all these news broadcasts which would use Dawn of the Dead music to help enhance the dread. Of the situation and such and so even now like all these decades later you know japanese tv is still heavily focused on the sort of sensationalism all the cheap publicity stuff that you know honda was poking fun at in king kong versus godzilla so not a whole lot has changed and if we go to the final slide i believe that's yeah just really briefly here are the primary sources that were used for putting together this uh presentation and the second slide And that should be the end of the presentation. Am I, am I correct? Yes, it is. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, everybody who's turned in, who's who tuned in for this whole thing. Uh, Matt, do you have anything that you want to uh, run past me before we uh, turn over to the audience? Well, I know I told you this privately before, but I'm just going to point it out there. You know, I don't, I don't really broadcast it out there so much that I'm a big pro wrestling fan, but listening to the stuff that you had talked about with like uh, classy Freddy Blasty and stuff uh, was something that I was not even aware of that I found, you know, extraordinarily interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I really, again, thank you for the time that you took to, to put all of that together because it really is wonderful. And there's, we've been getting a lot of really good comments here, but I, I apologize if my, if my voice is not sounding like my, my throat's been very dry all day. So it's <laughs> and, and talking for 45 minutes straight is not, is not helping. So <laughs> stop apologizing. So you certainly don't need to be apologizing for that. Sir. Okay. You, you okay. did a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, are you up for some uh, questions? Uh, well, sure. Yeah. Um, I can't promise to have all the answers, but I'll do my best. Let's see what we got. So guys go ahead and uh, ask your questions. If uh, you have any for Patrick in regards to this topic. I'm just scrolling up here to see if I actually have anything. I'm going to kick that out there too. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I know it should be the big surprise, but I guess the other like really surprising thing too is the fact that Japanese television hasn't changed at all. Period. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, it parallels American television, I think, pretty well as you know as mm -hmm. too. And all we go for is the or whatever that quote was about the grotesque and the weird mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing much has changed. I mean, that's why we have the Kardashians, you know, grotesque. <laughs> um, when did the Japanese TV drama start? Do you know when that, that might've, which, which drama are you talking about? I th maybe, maybe just dramas in general. I think somebody else was asking me that earlier too. Uh, well, I know they were making, I know they were making a uh, Japanese t TV. They're making Japanese television movies as late as, as early as say 1957, I do believe. So probably around that same time. I'm not a, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, but like, you know, those, those shows like, um, well, let me check my notes really quick here. I think I actually might know when that, um, 
when that one show in particular was made. Uh, well, the uh, the subject Days of Betrayal, the, the show Days of Betrayal, which was about the uh, extramarital affairs, that was done in 1960. So I okay. would say I would say that you know Japanese dramas had been established like you know probably in the late 50s or so. I don't know. I don't know 100. percent I don't know for sure though. Another question about when uh, certain when period drama. Oh yeah, good question. Um, that really started. That really started to take off in the uh, 1960s um, when the Japanese film industry is starting to fall apart and uh, period and uh, period dramas, which are like you know samurai films. That's when they started to migrate towards uh, television and such. And that, that that sort of helped open the market for things like you know uh, yakuza films, although that was also kind of like a short life fad as well because in the 1980s yakuza is primarily migrating to home video. Yeah. So it's so it's it's kind of like a cycle. It's kind of like a cycle and such. You know, once te once television is here, like you know, still in the market and such. Yeah, yeah. Some film genres will come up and get and get their thing, and then you know they'll be overpowered by home media and such. You know, the same is also true of uh, the pink industry, the porn industry in Japan. You know, Nikatsu survived on that for so many years, but you know that started to suffer a little bit too once the um, adult video market started to take over. Actually, Shusuke Shusuke Kaneko himself worked in the the pink industry for a number of years, and one of his films, a film called Last Cabaret, which which is from 1987, I believe, was kind of was made as kind of like a um uh, a, uh, an allegory for Nikatsu's collapse and and the collapse of the porn industry and such i believe it was also his last porn film but yeah it, it, yeah and the porn industry was falling apart because adult video market was was getting a, a wider audience and such so it is it is definitely kind of a cycle and such but yeah in terms of your question like yeah period dramas really started to take off in the 1960s and such when the film industry is falling apart and things are kind of shifting more and more towards tv i should also mention really quickly that um uh, in the 1950s, when TV started to take off, the film studios tried to combat the, the spread of TV by um, barring their star, their contract stars from acting in TV and such. And they also uh, started introducing introducing things like you know widescreen photography and such to help to hope in what they hoped to do to like you know help preserve the at home market for at, in, at the uh, domestic market for movies for going to the actual theater. Right. But, you know that that didn't last too terribly long, and that, that that's actually why. Um, in the 1980s um, and such, you know, the aspect ratio for Japanese movies changed from CinemaScope, the narrow format, to yeah. the sort of Vista Vision thing because you know that was e that was more easy that was easier and such like you know crop for home releases and such. So totally. Even, so even even on that so even on that kind of level, like you know, um, yeah, you know, home TV and home media impacted you know the Japanese film industry in so many ways, and you know it's. That's a reason why, again, TV was not the sole reason why the film industry fell apart in the 60s and such, but it was definitely a contributing factor. Absolutely. That's awesome. Do you know what the most popular form of entertainment for kids was during this time? Was it manga, radio, TV, or movies? That question, I do not know the answer to. Um, I would speculate that it was primarily television, but I do not know for sure. Makes sense. From Shay Smithers, was Akira Kurosawa ever involved in directing for TV shows? Not TV shows. However, he did, um, when his career was in a, an especially bad place in the 1970s, he did reluctantly get involved with like some television commercials. And he did direct a, a documentary called um, Song of the Horse, which was in 1971, I think. That, that was actually his last um, project with Masaru Sato, the composer who also did Sea Monster and Son of yeah. Godzilla and Mecha Godzilla. That was their final collaboration, and it was um, and it was a narrated documentary about the, the breeding of thoroughbred racehorses, and it was narrated by uh, an adult and a kid. And actually, the kid was was a, uh, um, I'm unfortunately blank on his name, but he was the kid who he was the kid actor from Hetera and Megalon. So that's awesome. So so yeah so yes and a very yeah Kurosawa along along with many filmmakers thought very little of TV. Honda wasn't even crazy about TV himself either. Honda worked in TV um, towards the end of his career, not by choice. You know, he wasn't really keen on it. It was just kind of like out of necessity and such. But yeah, many Japanese filmmakers thought lowly of TV and a lot of them got into it only because they had to at points. Like Masaki Kobayashi was another example. Uh, Keisuke Kinoshita uh, preferred working in movies but you know he realized like you know hey if i work in tv i get i get more work i get to do more more projects so though he wasn't keen on it he he sort of embraced it you know, luckily kurosawa didn't embrace it but he accepted it at a certain point yeah it, 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 i think it probably came to a point to where it's just they realized where everything was heading you mm -hmm. know 
and it's either you know evolve or go extinct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I understood this right from Fred. Do you think King Kong versus Godzilla opened the floodgates of bringing more Japanese films here? Example: Die Machine, Monster Terror, Gamera: The Invincible. It was definitely um, one of the one of the one of the factors because you know, don't forget around this time we had films like Mothra and such, which have you know foreign money and such, and an attempt to appeal more towards the Western market. And so, and also King Kong versus Godzilla, like you know, it began as a um, an unmade project by Willis O'Brien, was transferred to producer uh, John Beck, who negotiated the deal with RKO and um, Toho to get, and also got the rights to distribute the film by through Universal International Pictures. So. And that, and that, and that, and that, and of course, later on, you have like Henry G. Saperstein getting involved with things like, you know, Monster Zero and uh, uh, War of the Argantuas and Frank Sniper's Baragon. So it, well, I, would, I wouldn't say that it was, it was definitely not the first film to do that, but it was definitely a contrib contributing factor in that interest of like, you know, not only getting films shown in the U.S., but also getting American money behind the films as well. Yeah, yeah. That was really just a, a beautiful boom period. You know, I mean, that, mm. that's essentially the golden period, in my opinion, of, of that uh, mm. era. Uh, a few more questions here for you. This one's just a fun little one uh, from my boy Ben. When does Patrick come back on? Great stuff, Patrick. <laughs> when does Patrick come back on? Uh, th thank you, Ben. I'll, I'll come back whenever Matt says Patrick come back on the show. Uh, well, that might be sooner <laughs> than you think, good sir. Uh, from uh, Androyus, when did toy commercials started uh, start booming on Japanese TV? Do you know that? I don't know the answer to that question, but you know, TV commercials were took were. Yeah, it was basically instantaneous. Like you know, um, you know, Japanese companies realized that, um, like, it, funny enough, in, ter in terms of like you know, funny that King Kong versus Godzilla is about a pharmaceutical company trying to capitalize on TV and such. You know, the pharmaceutical companies in the fifties realized that you know, if they they could make if uh, let me pull my quote here really quickly. Actually, I can give you like the exact figures. <clears throat> a lot of these figures come from uh, uh, Chun's book, Hundred Nation, Hundred Million Idiots. Um, da, 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 da. please bear with me. No, you're good. Take your time. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, unfortunately, I can't find the quote, but you know, uh, uh, Japanese um, pr uh, companies and such found out that they could make a lot. They they get a, a lot more money, get a lot more products sold, and people would remember their products a lot better if they did it on television versus on radio. I think I think uh, I don't know for sure, so don't quote me. But I believe that you know they found that it was like forty percent more effective to broad to do commercials on TV as opposed to um, uh, radio. But yeah, they were they were doing it instantaneously as soon as Ricky Dozon was doing his matches against the Americans and such. Though they were out there plugging to get you know commercial airtime for their products because you know there's thousands of people watching on those plaza TVs and such. You know even though. Not, not many people have a TV. They're like, you know, in a department store or a barber shop or a cafe or on one of those plazas, you know, watching a Ricky Dozon, quote unquote, give it to, give it to the quote unquote Americans. And, you know, that's a good time to to uh, promote your product, you know, when thousands are watching. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with two more here, unless you, there's one that pops up that is just absolutely intriguing. Okay. But for Raf, uh, seeing how likable Mr. Taco was, do you feel the cruel businessmen Jiro and uh, Kumiyama from Mothra vs. Godzilla 64 were Honda's attempt to make up for the light satire with darker social commentary? That's a question only Honda could answer, and unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, I have not. I have not. That's a. It's certainly possible. It has. There's. I. I know. I know of nothing that would support that. I. I imagine Honda and Sakizawa were more just like um, doing a recycling of Clark Nelson from Mothra. That's. But I would speculate, but you know, who knows? Yeah, that, that might be something you know, unfortunately lost to history. Mm -hmm. um, and then, well, along with why did he make Terameki Godzilla? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Last one, possibly for the rest of this evening. So, what do you say, Ricky Dozen's popularity is basically why a number of Jap uh, Japanese films, shows, manga, and anime use wrestling in their plots, like Karate Baka Ichidai. I'm sure. I'm sure it was a factor. I mean, Japan's always had an interest in like you know sumo and such. Um, and actually, actually, there's a if you want to there's another, another film recommendation. There's a film from 1959 by the director Yasujiro Ozu called um, uh, Ohio Good Morning, mm -hmm. and um, it's basically about two kids who become infatuated with um, sumo wrestling on TV, and they decide to go on a silent strike. They vow to stop speaking to their parents until their parents break down and buy them a TV set. This is from '59, so. Not long before King Kong versus Godzilla and such, so yeah, I'm I'm sure that you know um, Ricky Dozon absolutely had some kind of like you know, um, 
um, at least some capacity, some kind of influence, that kind of thing. But yeah, Japan, Japan's always had a uh, um, fascination with, with that kind of stuff. Yeah, that is very true. That is very, very, very true. Even to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my friend, is there anything else that you would like to cover? I mean, besides plugging your stuff, but is there anything else you would like to cover before jumping to that segment? Uh, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head. I just, uh, again, I reiterate, I hope that um, people enjoyed this presentation. Uh, thank you, Matt, for uh, not only green lighting this, um, this, uh, this proposal of mine, but actually bringing me on to do it here. Um, it was a, a lot of fun to talk about in spite of my already again, drying out voice. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I hope it, I hope it was. Yeah, yeah. Your voice is, you, you were, you were perfect tonight. In fact, okay. you know what? throwing one extra question because this, this goes in with plugs from Ben Patrick, when you plan on writing a book, you should as much knowledge as you have in your disposal. Well, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it this way. Um, for the last year or so, I have been writing a book. I am not going to, uh, reveal its topic at the moment, but I will tell you at the risk of disappointing you that it has a hundred thousand percent nothing to do with Kaiju, nothing to do with Honda or any of those people. It's about Japanese movies. Um, and it's, it's, it, it involves actually to some extent, like, you know, what I was talking about today in terms of, like TV and, and the TV and the film industry in Japan. But, you know, I, I don't want, I want to wait until I get a lot further along with the book before I reveal its topic and such. So yes, I, Short answer, I'm writing a book. Yes. Uh, no, it's not about kaiju. So I'm sorry if that <laughs> disappoints a lot of people watching this. <laughs> no, I mean, there's a lot of people in this chat, actually. I mean, as the uh, as you were uh, delivering the presentation that were also, you know, chiming in on the historical historical factoids and stuff. So there are a lot of people who are interested in the subject, you know, uh, beyond the realm of just the kaiju egg and the tokusatsu, you know, so mm. definitely cannot wait for that. Uh, but until then, until people can read the book, where can people find you? Where can they read your stuff? Plug your social media uh, places if, if you're on there and, and the places where people can can read your work. Uh, well, you can read my work at uh, Toe Kingdom, uh, sci-fi.com. You can read my work at um, uh, Our Culture Magazine. And I recently, actually just today, I published an article for the, web, for the Canadian website uh, off screen about the Chinese silent film actress Ron Ling Yu, who is one of my favorite film for film performers in the history of cinema. Um, After we're done with this, shoot a link to me so I can add that to the information huh. down here below. So that way people can go find it because I would like to read that too. That sounds really awesome. I will right, we'll do that. Uh, but yeah, that's basically you know, Toe Kingdom, Sci-Fi.com, Our Culture Mag, and now off screen. Oh, also I should also mention I do have an essay in uh, John LeMay's uh, Lost Film Fanzines, also about Ron Lingu, as it happens. I and actually, I have, I, they're in a box over there. I'd go and grab <laughs> it out, but yes. Go, it's, a, it's, that stuff. it's issue number four. And, I, and also, um, uh, nope, that's the end of it, actually. Yeah, just the issue number four of his uh, Lost Films Fanzines is where, I ha is where you can find my writing. You know what? I, I didn't think I was going to do this, but I'm going to do this. You also have a short piece in Joel Carroza's book. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. Encyclopedia, which is available on Amazon right now, guys. Go check this out. Uh, Patrick has a little uh, uh, tidbit of Japanese history in here. Really cool stuff. And uh, this is filled with a lot of great content. So, Patrick, again, thank you so much for doing this today. It was a ton of fun. Uh, really informative. And you know, thank you for taking the time uh, for putting all that presentation together and then just speaking to all of us here today. I know a lot of people enjoyed it. Yeah, it was my pleasure and it was a lot of fun. So guys, I guess with that said, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up here. So uh, for Godzilla's sake, keep watching Tokusatsu for the good of mankind and yourselves. I'm Matt here with Patrick Galvin here to say, please collect responsibly. Sorry to the Nari. And I, we will probably end up seeing you several times next week for Godzilla versus Kong Godzilla singular point episode two and so on and so forth. Take care guys. Thank you so much for coming in.